All right, so good, good evening, everyone. Welcome again to the Henry George School for uh, our new course. As you could see from the title, the coming 2026 financial and economic crisis, the evidence for a catastrophic depression occurring in the United States. So the instructor tonight is Edward Dodson. Uh, those who are familiar with the Henry George School very well know Ed, but I can see that we have also some new faces and very happy to have you all here tonight. Uh, Ed is a retired financial sector executive, and but he's also known for uh, uh, his long-standing experience as an instructor at the Henry George School. So he's a published author. He's also the founder of uh, a website called the School of uh, and, and Corporate Cooperative individualism. Is that correct, Ed? Cooperative individualism. Cooperative individualism. So the website is just as I put it, I think there is an ORG at the end. So this course is going to be done in five sessions. So tonight is going to be the first one. So without any ado, Ed, the floor is yours. Well, welcome, everybody, and uh, thanks for joining me. I've been working to develop the material for this course for about six months. Um, as you can imagine, the amount of data that's available, the statistics that are available is enormous to try to determine where we are in the current economic cycle. Uh, and this course, in a sense, is arguing the case that we are the uh, victims of economic cycles, in part because we have flawed uh, systems of socio-political arrangements and institutions, uh, policies that are wrong-headed, including taxation policies. So there's, there's going to be a lot of discussion uh, about those issues in this course. It's really an examination of the historical record, the underlying market forces, and the ongoing stresses that really destined the U.S. economy to experience yet another prolonged period of financial and economic crisis. And I am uh, reluctant to go this far, but I think perhaps it might be the worst ever. And, and that's something we'll have to discuss during the course. First thing is, I would like this to be as interactive as you want to make it. So using the uh, Q&A function, you know, raise your yellow hand if you want to make a, ask a question or make a comment. If, you, if something that I argue for, if I argue, make a statement on a certain position that you think may not be the right one, feel free to challenge me. Uh, I've tried to use my best judgment over a 50-year career in the financial sector uh, and teaching the political economy based on Henry George for a very long time. So uh, I've done my best to be objective and hopefully am mostly right, but I expect that some of you in this class have as much experience or more than I do and maybe an expertise in certain areas that you can uh, share your expertise and knowledge with the rest of us. So feel free to, to join in. The other thing I would say is um, I hope that we can finish in five sessions. I, my experience has been that when the class is very participative, uh, sometimes we run out of time before we run out of material to cover. So we'll see how this goes. And depending upon where we are at the end of five weeks, I will ask Ibrahima if we maybe can extend it, or maybe we will get, we'll finish in five weeks or even a little bit earlier. Just it's impossible to say. So with that, um, let me introduce you to this subject with this interesting beginning. This is kind of how we feel about you know, what's going on in the world. Uh, the daily news on the state of the US economy is often contradictory. Economists, government spokespersons, the chairman of the Federal Reserve System, and economic commentators 
they all look at trends and statistics and they offer differing views of where we are and where we're headed. And so depending upon what expert, quote expert, you're listening to, you're going to get a unique perspective and perhaps one that is supported or one that isn't. What we must look at, I think, are the cumulative stresses building in key segments of the economy, government and our society. So armed with these insights, I think we have a good chance of seeing what the future holds and maybe just maybe taking corrective action. And that's as difficult a part of the story as anything is what we're gonna to do to correct the problems that we have. So here's the first thing I want you to look at. Um, before I say anything, just take a look at this graph and what it's telling you. It's a look at the boom to bust nature of the US economic system just since the 1970s. Cycles keep repeating, despite the changes we make in law, despite the changes in public policies and taxation, despite warfare, despite human caused disasters and despite disasters that we might define as natural. And what's different in this graph is only the depth and duration of the cyclical crashes that, that occur. Um, and there's, there's a lot of disagreement in the, in the economics world and uh, the financial world about why these cycles occur in the way they occur, what brings, them, brings us out of these cycles more quickly, uh, or what causes the cycles to be protracted. And hopefully we're gonna get to some of that analysis. Now, here's another chart that goes back several centuries, covers between 1880s and 1950. And the measurement that's used to determine the ups and downs is gross domestic product. Now, I'm not, most of you, I'm sure, know what gross domestic product is, but I'm going to you know, make sure that I define it so everyone understands. It's the standard measurement relied on by government analysts and most economists. However, uh, caution is really necessary where GDP is relied upon as an indication of society's well being. Anybody have a thought as to why I say that? Why is it, why is caution necessary? Well, I don't know if I gave you enough chance to respond, but my reasoning for saying that is that the definition of GDP provides the answer. Um, would anybody be willing to, to be a reader this week? What that means is anything, anytime I have quoted material on the screen, I would ask you to be the reader. It'll give me a break from talking and also give some diversity to the voices that are heard. So, is there anyone who's got a good microphone and would be a vo good volunteer? I see a hand up, but I don't know whose it is. It just says iPad. Take off your, uh, uh, unmute yourself and let me know who's talking. No? Okay. You may, be, well, so, you may be able to unmute yourself by just uh, clicking on the mic. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Wayne Hutchinson. I'm not sure if you could see my hand earlier, but uh, well, we can um, see your yellow hand, Wayne. If, if you're you're on iPad, right? Uh, no, that's no, that wouldn't be me. Oh. Um, Would you like to volunteer to be the reader? I'm, I'm, but I'm happy to read if uh, if that helps. But if Thank the other you. gentleman or, or, or person comes back, uh, the iPad person, uh, <laughs> they were first in. Um, well, uh, you've stepped forward, and so I I accept you as a volunteer. Thank you. All right, wonderful. Thanks. So you your first assignment off, uh, by reading this, Edward. Yep, that's your first assignment. 
Okay, done. All right, GDP is defined as the value of all goods and services produced within the geographic territory of an economic, uh, of, sorry, of an economy in a given interval, such as a year. Now that sounds perfectly reasonable as something to measure. So why am I concerned? Why, are, why are, is there concern raised? Well, think about it this way. The destruction of material goods caused by warfare or natural disasters is essentially ignored. However, expenditures on the military, on cleanup and rebuilding of what is destroyed by warfare or by hurricanes, by tornadoes and other disasters adds to GDP measurement. And to quote someone who has some authority in the world uh, in terms of influence, Joseph Stiglitz says, GDP is not a good measure of economic performance. It is not a good measure of well-being. And so we see that the problem, in a sense, is the correlation between increases in GDP and improvement in living conditions, while it seems persuasive on the surface, is not necessarily a one-for-one -one benefit. When GDP increases, maybe things aren't getting better necessarily. So we have to look deeper into what's happening in society to really get a clear picture of what reality is. And this is the way in the classroom I would explain it. If I was teaching uh, the basic course in fundamental course in political economy, this is what I would say to students. You still have the beginning stock of tangible wealth. And you can think of this as a pie chart, okay? So uh, the existing stock of, of, of wealth is this pie. And every, every year or whatever period you're covering, you have new production that increases the size of the pie. But the pie also decreases by consumption and by destruction uh, or simple depreciation. And, and so if there's greater growth than destruction, consumption, you're going to have an increase in the pie. But there are, there are conditions in which the declining size of the pie, the, the, the amount being lost is greater than what's being produced. And so at the end of the period, you're going to have a net real loss in tangible wealth. My view, therefore, is that a much better measurement of what, what our economy is, is doing would be a measurement that, that looks at capital goods and other tangible wealth and the value thereof and what changes during a, during a year to year. So that's, that's one thing just to keep in mind as we go through some of the statistics that we're going to cover. Just to give you another example of, of how much destruction might occur and how GDP would then even be increased, is take a look at, at a building like this. When abandoned homes and other bu buildings are demolished, the cost of the demolition increases GDP, even if the tangible capital is decreased. Even the buildings are never replaced. The cost of clearing the site, all that is money spent, and so it goes into the GDP calculation. Now, there are adjustments made to GDP to try to correct this, but um, the general feeling is GDP is an easy measurement because you're just looking at numbers that are reported by various you know, producers and, and parts of the economy, and that's data collected. But does it really tell us what is going on? An alternative some of you may be familiar with was created uh, some years ago by the Friends of the Earth, and it's called the Genuine Progress Indicator. And this indicator was developed to include key environmental health factors. So the data included within the GPI revealed that the overall well-being of a significant percentage of the U.S. population reached its peak in the 1970s and has been declining ever since. And what should interest us is why this is happening and what ought to be done about it. So. Uh, there are about six or seven states in the United States that actually use the GPI in their analysis of the, 
of the state of this society in that state. Uh, one is Connecticut, and I, I forget what the other ones are. Okay, excuse me a second. So you have GDP. Well, what else? What else are economists using? Well, uh, there are all sorts of, of types of of economic models that are that are being utilized by the various schools of economic theorists, and they're evolving all the time based on the access to different sources of information, sources of data. So this is just a set of of different economic models and what they potentially can tell us. But none of them, none of them have yet been able to accurately forecast the, the economic cycles that we experience. And the question is, is it because of insufficient data or is it because the models lack some fundamental aspect of analysis that's required in order to achieve an accurate forecast of what's going to happen in the economy. And, and that's what we'll get to uh, as this course proceeds. A current approach to analysis by some economists is referred to as the real business cycle theory. And that examines the impact of various systemic, technological, and other shocks that spread throughout a society's economy. So, with real business cycle theory, the underlying assumption is that except for these shocks, the economy would continue on a sustainable path. And I'm just giving you an image of, of, of some of the shocks and one consequence, that picture of the VW micro bus being pulled by, by two horses is a, is a perfect example of how bad it was in the 1970s during that, the period of the OPEC oil crisis and stagflation. And there are parts of the world right now where, as you know, uh, you know, automobiles and trucks and everyone who use gasoline is lining up waiting for gasoline that isn't available. And those economies are going into a, a deep stall. <clears throat> well, think about, you know, the most recent crisis, 2008. To some, the financial and economic crisis of 2008 can be viewed as a consequence of rapidly occurring shocks to the global economic system. Um, we had you know, tremendous financial speculation. Um, in the United States, constantly we, we hear reference to the subprime mortgage loan crisis. And I, I lived through that and worked through that in my, in my uh, working years. Uh, I was at Fannie Mae in, from 84 to 2005, and, and in the late 1990s, until I retired in 2005, the subprime mortgage crisis was building to a crescendo. Um, those of us who worked in the trenches, we saw it coming, uh, but we, we had no, no way to really make, do anything about it. Uh, there are a lot of reasons for that. <clears throat> One at Fannie Mae and similar financial companies was simply this, that in order to satisfy Wall Street's demands to support your stock price, you had to continually show growth in your, your business volume, in your transaction volume, and also in your ability to con control expenses. So there's, there's this pr enormous pr pressure on financial institutions to keep transaction volume up, even in the face of declining uh, per unit profits. Uh, so that's part of what was going on at the time. Uh, now to others, as the predictable outcome of long-term existing systemic problems. That is what caused the financial crisis. Not so much shocks, but there's these long-term existing systemic problems that periodically reach a level of stress and that triggers a severe contraction. And, and even to others, uh, as a result of these other factors, there are there's the addition of something like climate change. So, is climate change a shock to the system, or is it part of the changing systemic environment? And uh, is it make it inevitable that we're going to face this this periodic crisis because we just can't get ahead of these these, these changes that are going on in our systems? 
And that, that, that part of the question will lead us to some discussion about, well, Ed, what can we do? You know, can we, can we get out of this? Can, can the economic cycles be stopped? Or is it simply that we're gonna, we can try to mitigate the consequences of them, but never eliminate them? And I'm not sure I have the answer, but we'll have plenty of opportunity to discuss that. Any questions or thoughts so far? Gil. Yeah. Scotty Hi, Gowan here, mate, from Australia down under. Apologize about the iPad dropped out, but mate, we're back in the game. Thank you. Okay. Gil, you got a question, comment? Well, Kutch's comment, harking back to GDP and well being, uh, GDP does not measure the distribution of wealth. So no. that's a big failing. It has nothing to do with distribution. Right. But it doesn't measure well being <clears throat> because of that. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I've had <clears throat> come down with a bit of a a raspy throat so hopefully uh, uh you'll bear with me if i have to stop and take some water every now and then peter you had a question comment yes um hi ed hi everybody um what you said about um the fact that transactions were so important uh during the fi global financial crisis that's very interesting i've never heard that before could you could you just explain a little bit behind that well, it's um, in the financial services sector, which everyone uh, looks to as a leading cause of uh, the crash, yeah, there's an, an enormous competition and the profit margins are constantly diminishing. And so the only way you keep up the net, your net profit is by increasing transaction volume. So if, if your normal returns are 3% on whatever dollars are invested, currency invested, and that falls to 2%, uh, then you have to increase your transaction volume in order to get the, sa to get the same dollar revenue uh, to generate a net 3% profit. So would that pressure be would that pressure exist in an environment where interest rates were high well <laughs> well if if interest rates are high what's happening to your costs so if you're in the financial sector or your or any business really and and the central bank is raising interest rates that means that savers are going to earn more on their savings but sure. borrowers are going to have to pay more so but the, the need for transactions, though, is the need for tra transactions as great in an, in an environment with high interest rates as it would as it is in, with low interest rates? Um, it all depends on the difference between you got you have your cost of funds, you have your operating expenses, and then and, and then you're going to have a uh, a profit based on the difference between that and what you can make loans for or earn on investments. So yeah. for different firms, the pressures might be greater or lesser, <laughs> but, but, uh, but there's going to always be that squeeze and the, the um, necessity of maintaining market share and, and transaction volume is going to be there. I'm not saying it for every business, but definitely in the financial sector, it's there. Right. Um, so during the GFC, the need for transactions, though, was because uh, I think you said the the either interest rates or the return on investment. You know, the the percent percent profit, perhaps was that sure. what was the percent number? Well, uh, three, that you, three percent is is generally acknowledged as the net return required to stimulate investment okay okay so okay so obviously obviously every every business is going to want greater returns than that but that's generally the minimum that's acceptable it's going to stimulate you to invest in new capital equipment hire new employees uh new technologies etc and so anytime it goes below three percent there's there's pressure to create more transactions. Yeah, yeah. Right. 
because and did the Fed did the Fed or who who but I might be getting ahead of of, of you and I'll I'll shut up in a minute. I'm sorry to to hijack you. Uh, did the Fed stimulate that through quantitative easing or other measures? Um, quantitative easing as as interest rates fell after 2010. Uh, made it possible for the financial institutions to rebuild what they call risk-based capital, okay? Yeah. Whether or not, and this is what's been controversial around the world, whether or not the bank simply sat on that new money or used it to stimulate the economy is, is a real question. Or use, okay. use, use quantitative easing funds that they acquired at zero interest rates from the Federal Reserve to pay their executives enormous bonuses um, so, you know, this is where the, the, when you start talking about this, this, the outcome, you really, we get into this discussion of what system, what laws need to be changed, what public policies need to be changed, uh, including tax policy. Yeah. Because, um, I, my personal perspective is most business people would rather not have competition. They would rather have some sort of privilege under law. And if they're forced to compete, they'll compete. But um, the Manufacturers Associations, the American Bankers Association, they're always lobbying with government for some special privileges and protections under law. Yeah. So anything, anyone Thank have you. any? So, Peter, stay tuned. There's going to be a lot more to go through. And you're absolutely. I have a quick question. Does GDP include inflation? Does GDP include inflation? Well, yes. there's real GDP and there's nominal GDP. So if you're talking about nominal GDP, you're talking about the actual numbers. And then real GDP will look at inflation adjusted increases or decreases. So, I mean, every time you look at one of these charts, they'll always, they'll usually give you uh, information that says uh, this information is in, is inflation adjusted or it's nominal. So let's, okay. let's take a look at the, this first chart. Okay. This is the United States real GDP from 1948 to 2019. Okay. So. This is not the nominal numbers, it's adjusted. And what base year they're using here, I don't know. Um, but they okay. usually, they, go ahead. Because my point is they took out housing and put in rentals. Yes. To judge inflation. Big mistake. That, that is making inflation look a lot lower. Yes, that's an astute observation. And, and and it and is is one reason why these the the uh, when you hear when you listen to the radio and you have a news commentator interview someone uh, from the economics field and they talk about it uh, what's what's happening hardly ever does anyone get into a discussion about housing as a fundamental cause of inflation and prices. When in right. fact, in my view, it is a fundamental contributor. Exactly, and the problem is they keep on changing the goalpost. Um, well, one could argue that uh, those in government, depending upon what side of the aisle they're on and what whether or not they're in office or out and out of office, want to paint the best picture possible, or paint exactly. the worst picture possible. <laughs> so. Um, the message is listen with skepticism uh, about what you're hearing and do your own research. There's plenty of info. I mean, I, I, have, I'm, I haven't done any original research to create this course. All of the information I'm giving you is publicly available on the Internet. You just have to be willing to spend six months to dig it out. <laughs> okay. So. So the, you raise a question, are these measurements off or was there a net decline in the stock of tangible capital goods, as I argued before? Because you see along this history, there are periods of negative growth. So that means that real GDP, as measured, fell 
down below what it was the previous period measure. And my question is, it would be great to have a valuation of real tangible goods, separate capital goods and, and other goods as well. But this is all, this is complex, no doubt about it, because everything we produce is in a constant state of depreciation. So all of the capital goods that exist today are depreciating while we talk. The computer that I'm looking at, it's depreciating in functional utility. It's depreciating in its resale value as I am using it, as we're all using all of this, this equipment. And uh, if some of you are having your dinner while you're, you're attending this class, you're consuming some tangible wealth. Well, you know, it, it's a question of inventories then how you know our invent inventories are fluctuating all the time and are they increasing because of increased demand or are the inventories increased because reduced sales and so that's why we have the dollar stores because businesses produce goods they go into inventory and maybe the demand isn't as strong as they thought it, it, it was going to be and so they have excess product that's costing them money to store. And so the people who own the dollar stores come along and say, we have trucks ready to be loaded and we'll pay you 60% of what it costs for you to produce these goods or some percentage, and we'll take it out of your, your inventory. And so we get a lot of goods <clears throat> that are sold at or below cost of production. Uh, but that creates transaction volume, and that's going to add to GDP. Okay. May I ask a question? <laughs> yes. Question? Yes. Uh, you started out basically defining GDP, and then you went into a, a criticism of it because it doesn't uh, represent uh, increase or decrease in wealth. But to me, that's not what GDP is trying to measure. It's measuring production. You can bring other elements in to determine wealth, savings, destruction, and so forth. So why, why are you criticizing GDP for something that doesn't purport to do to begin with? Because, well, the criticism is because it's used generally to convince the public that the economy is growing and at what rate it's growing without any kind of meaningful explanation to the public of what it actually means, what is actually being measured. Now, well, that's not the fault of GDP, if, that's the fault of pundits and, and my oh, um, If you, there are, there's plenty of papers, there are plenty, there's plenty of analysis that takes the base GDP figures and further analyzes them. And so if you're, if you're an economist uh, or you're teaching a course in economics at a college or university and you're discussing this, you're gonna go into that detail perhaps. And so those who are in the economics discipline are gonna have a more thorough understanding of what's actually going on. But the general public is not going to get any of that on, the tel on television or the radio. And, and again, if you're willing to do the, the research, you'll get a better perspective. But um, it also, as, as the genuine progress indicator in set tells us, GDP does not give us a good idea of whether or not the general well-being of people is increasing and what the distribution of that general welfare is. Some people in our society are doing much, much better. Uh, over time, their asset, as their net worth is increased because the assets they hold are increasing in value. Uh, other people uh, have little or no savings. One out of four senior citizens in the United States today is living on Social Security benefits alone. They have no savings, no pension fund. So uh, a, a lot more in-depth analysis is required to tell us whether or not the overall economy is is really expanding or doing well and doing it sustainably. And then you have to get into all this, these other you know, analysis of the demographics 
and who's benefiting, who's not, which is why we have this major debate and argument in our country about wealth inequality and what to do about it. Okay, well, we have many measurements that are not perfect in what they tell us, but they are approximations or provide indicators, indications of what may or may not be happening. So I, I, no, I, I still... I'm you can reach your own conclusions, of course. You can reach your own conclusions, of course. I side, I side with Stiglitz and others who think we need to be looking at other measurements uh, besides GDP. It's just that GDP is so um, easy to use. And, hey, and I, sometimes the easy not to use... GDP. I'm sorry? I understand now. You're not faulting GDP per se. You're faulting the way it's used which is not GDP's fault. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting that it's one tool in the basket and it's not necessarily the best tool to rely on. Got it. Thank you. Okay. If, I mean, if anyone in the, in the class tonight is teaching economics, uh, I'd love, I'd love to hear you tell me, you know, tell us, you know, what you're saying to your students about the use of, of GDP or other measurement tools as well. Uh, Wayne Looney. Uh, yeah, yes. There are some of the things that are inherently pro problematic with GDP. Uh, for example, I'll just give a couple of examples. Uh, tobacco, uh, tobacco sales and, and uh, money spent on lung cancer treatment are additive. Legal yeah, fees yeah. on both sides of the same case are additive. Yep, yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's exactly right, Wayne. I mean, it's just totaling up with people and industry and government and everybody spends. And, and so you have to look very closely at the components of GDP to determine whether or not that spending is actually productive or not. Okay, let's... Let's move on a little, a little bit more. Um, um, I mean, here again is just by the measurement, we have periods of time when GDP has declined. The economy has not produced uh, sufficient spending to increase GDP. And so one challenge is looking at these declines to see where they were in the economic cycle. Okay, it's not something we're going to do, but but that's one thing that if you're if you're an analyst, you would look for a correlation to see these negative these periods of negative real GDP growth. How do they correlate to where we are in the economic cycle? How repetitive are they? What do they tell us about what we can expect in a normal quote normal economic cycle? Now, um, one part of the reason that the current, the pat, <clears throat> excuse me. I really apologize for my <clears> throat. throat. Hopefully, it'll get better. But tonight, I'm, I'm doing. I'm having some congestion problems. Uh, okay. So this next chart shows changes in prices from year, from year before. Okay. So. A general decline in prices, what economists refer to as broad deflation, did not occur in the years immediately following the 2008 crisis. Okay, in a serious depression, you're going to have deflation. Normally, that's what, what's going to happen. Prices fell back only briefly and then once again began to increase almost every year after 2010, as you can see on this, on this chart. That downward downward slope in 2010, and then almost immediately went back up. So the question is, what reasons come to mind for this level of support for the price of most goods? You, you, you're all you're all there in 2010. What happened to stimulate prices going back up so that we did not have a typical deflationary period that would occur at the trough of an economic cycle. Thoughts? Wayne? 
Well, we we bailed out the banks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We poured, yeah, we poured, we poured money into the economy. We poured, bailed out the banks, and uh, we also helped people too, not just the banks. So you have um, an increase in our spending on unemployment benefits. The federal government stepped in with what was titled the Emergency Unemployment Compensation Program. And that put hundreds of billions of dollars in the hands of people who lost their employment after 2008. Now, compared to what went into the financial sector, the amount was, was fairly small, but without it, there would have been more intense credit losses, uh, many more apartment evictions, many more property foreclosures, and a protracted recession that might have fallen into a deep depression. Michael, do you want to, you've turned your camera on, did you want to say something? Uh, uh, the Fed increased the money supply, making the price of many goods and services inelastic. So people would purchase things they wouldn't have purchased with less, with less money. You know, GDP is equal to the supply of money times the velocity of money. And even if you hold the velocity constant, simply increasing the supply will increase GDP. Yes. What's more important, that. what's more important, however, is who gets the increased supply of money and how that money is utilized in, term, in terms of whether or not you're creating more real economic growth or not. So I would argue, and, and this is, I'm building on something that, that the economist Mason Gaffney said at a conference many years ago, um, the economy grows much faster and, and, and more uh, meaningfully by how much money is spent on toilet paper and to toothpaste and those basic, what he, what he referred to as short-lived, you know, commodities. Or, or, or goods, as opposed to putting money into the financial sector uh, to make long-term, slowly evolving investments. So you have, to, you have to think about, did the government do the right thing? Well, a lot of people have criticized what the US government and other governments did in 2008 to prop up the financial system. Uh, but there's been the argument if they hadn't done that and we had had it, had a real uh, collapse of the financial system, then we would have had a global depression th that would have been uh, far worse. My so, point is, it, it propped up a lot more than just the financial system, it allowed the financial system to make funds available to everybody to purchase goods and services. And to the extent that the money came out of the bank's vaults to do that, yes. The question has been you know, put to the banks uh, and the regulators is, did the banks put the appropriate amount of credit or, or, or lending into the economy, or did they simply prop up their, their risk-based capital in order to, to rebuild their stock price and pay themselves enormous you know, bonuses? And didn't we have the longest period of GDP growth nearly in history? Um, the chart Un shows un uninterrupted GDP, GDP yeah. growth. All of that is on, I would argue, nominally on the surface seems to be very true. The question now we get to, Michael, as we go through this course, is the analysis of what else was taking place. And did and, and were the actions of the central bank and other central banks setting the stage for the eventual increase in stresses on the economy that will reach the, the maximum stress point in 2026? Even even it's 2022 right now, and we're starting to feel a lot of these stress points because of shocks. Hmm. What the government does to manage this process will get us to 2026 uh, without a major contraction again, or are we 
basically going to experience what 2026 would would produce earlier. And we're going to find that out. I mean, we're, every day on the news right now, there's all the discussion about whether or not what the Federal Reserve is doing is going to bring upon a recession. And how do we measure is it a recession? Is, is, is it two periods of declining GDP? You know, uh, what, it, what about unemployment? So going back to the 2007, 2008 period, this graph shows you what the various unemployment measurements told us. And this comes from shadow stats, which is a longstanding critical uh, website of, of formal of, of uh, official government statistics. So the official unemployment rate during this period is in red. And you can see you know what what happened to it during the period up until 2008 when it started to climb. But all throughout this period, there are many, many people, who are not working, but are not counted as unemployed. And there are many other people who are working part-time who would prefer to work full-time if they could find full-time employment. And there are many people who are underemployed in the sense that their skills and education and experience qualify them for a position that's not available. So what was the real rate of unemployment? That's, that's the question. So uh, the people at Shadow Stats, they thought that it was about three times higher than the official rate. And other critiques, critics show different measurements. So you have the U6 measurement, which is about double. Well, what was the real rate of unemployment? I, I don't remember who, who was the uh, author of this statement, but somebody said, well, if your neighbor is unemployed, it's a recession. If you're unemployed, it's a depression. So it really depends on where you are in, in the economy at that point in time, how traumatic the situation is for you. Peter or uh, Michael, Michael Lenoy. Lord, Lord, Michael, how do you pronounce your last name? I never really did. Michael Leroy. Leroy. Leroy, yeah. Leroy, Ackroyd. It's, it's a Yorkshire name. Leroy. <laughs> anyway, that's um, nice that, to see you, though. You know, so, so what's on your mind? The thought that occurred to me, Ed, actually, is the fact that we are we are in one of these difficult times at the moment. In, prices are increasing, and and what it's doing. If you've got savings, that that th they're being challenged to keep up with the price increases. Now th that that might be seen in one sense is that savings have increased too much. Therefore, it's a way of gleaning off all that excess savings for the, for the better. But if it, but, but when you get, when my savings get down to a point, then poverty starts to show its head and great discomfort. That, that seems to be a, a, a very interesting phenomenon that's happening. Whether well, it's justice operating, that we've all become a bit too affluent, or a lot of people are becoming far too affluent and taken too much out of the economy. And, and now it's going to be taken back. But, it, but there's, a, there's a lot of people who are, who are distressed because of that process. I don't know if that makes sense to anyone. <laughs> well, how we feel about the world depends upon where we stand. So, uh, you know, I, I just, there is a segment of our society, whether or not it's the top 25% of households, the top 10% of households, or what the exact figure is, um, you know, who have net worth that allows those individuals basically to uh, obtain a significant portion of their income from investment. And depending upon, you know, your appetite for risk, you're going to find a financial advisor is going to tell you, well, you should put, uh, X percent of your assets in fixed income investments, X percent of your assets in equities, maybe a bit in precious metals, uh, you know, all of, all of depending upon what other sources of income you have and how much your expenses are and what you need, et cetera, et cetera. So 
as interest rates are rising, those people who have uh, significant assets to invest may be pulling some of their assets out of the equities market where, where they had good returns, but where there's higher risk uh, as the economy becomes a little bit less, becomes more unstable and putting into government securities. So now they're getting 3% as opposed to not very long ago, they might not even be getting 1%. So those individuals have experienced a significant increase in disposable income. Whereas if you are now in the market for purchasing a residential property, your mortgage interest rate may be double what it would be, would have been a year and a half ago or so. So it really depends on your circumstance. And as, as I mentioned earlier, one out of four senior citizens in the United States, senior citizen led households, lives on social security benefits alone. That's, pretty, that's a pretty small income in, a, in an environment where you have rising uh, expenses for sure. rent for an apartment, your for utilities, for, for automobile transportation, for insurance, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it- We're all suffering, really. Well, see, this is what I mean, Michael. You can't say we're all suffering. The well, suffering, the distribution of suffering tends to those at the 50% of area median income and below, and particularly to those individuals who are renters as opposed to property owners. Although, Although, depending on, on where you live, your, uh, your annual owners, your cost of owning a property in the United States could be climbing considerably based on property tax payments. Yeah. So all, all of these variables, and you're sitting there, let's say you're sitting with, you're sitting with, with President Biden around the table with his Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, and you're trying to come up with po policies that are going to uh, enable the economy to keep a sustainable growth rate, dealing with all of these distributional issues, as well as uh, the, the war that's going on between Russia and the Ukrainians and supporting the military defense budget. Um, when we, we're going to get into... The funding of all this activity and the and the options that are put on the table and the arguments about those options uh, fairly quickly in this course. Peter, I think you're next. All right. I just wanted to throw something in. Um, you know, I'm not an expert, so I don't have an opinion about whether, you know, you don't have to be an expert to have an opinion. I, I don't consider yeah. my, myself an expert, um, but I have plenty of opinions. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, it, I mean, it's just kind of a technical thing. But anyway, there are there are some people who say that quantitative easing uh, really only, uh, you know, it, it was an exchange of um, of bank reserves for for assets, whether it was uh, mortgage backed securities or whatever. Um, and so it didn't exactly inject money into the economy. You can't spend a bank reserve to buy a cup of coffee. So nobody, no employment doesn't rise as a result of an increase in bank reserves. And then when you figure that banks got interest on excess uh, bank reserves, that was an incentive not to lend. And so um, what you said maybe five minutes ago, you know, that banks didn't lend, in fact, um, as it was hoped, you know, it's, it's quite true. So, so QE didn't really re result in, in any increase in employment. Um, so it's, it's not exactly money printing per se. And it, and it also had, according to others, not to me, it just people I listen to, you know, it had the effect of draining the economy of collateral for, I suppose, the money markets, you know, collateral that can be used like in repo markets, maybe, or whatever the, whatever the short-term uh, lending between firms and banks and so forth to get over a, a financial hump in the short term. So it puts like, it's like a liquidity trap, you know? Well, so let me um, just make one comment about this. Remember that we live in a world where, where credit is available globally. So right. uh, 
the large financial institutions are global. And so yeah. while the source of, of quant quantitative easing went to certain segments of the economy, uh, what about HSBC? Or what, what about, you know, the major uh, players? Uh, and, and you haven't even talked about the, the Chinese and what they're doing with, you know, when they sell goods to the United, to purchasers in the United States and they get dollars, they have all sorts of options of what to do with those dollars. They can certainly hold them. They can invest in U.S. government securities, or they can use those dollars to exchange for other currencies to invest, to purchase agricultural land in Africa, or they can purchase condominiums uh, and high-rise hotels or, or other tangible assets all around the world. Uh, you know, I did, I did an analysis when I was in graduate school, uh, uh, a project the, the, the question was, what is the optimum price of a barrel of oil for the Saudis? This was in the 1980s. And so uh, at the time, it was very difficult to get information about Saudi assets, where they invested their money. But I managed to pull enough together to, to do an analysis to show the Saudis had already diversified their economy to try to offset the risk of concentration in terms of investment in fossil fuels. So they own banks, they own uh, cement companies, they own construction companies, they own uh, hotels. So when you, you factor all that together, the answer to the question can't be the highest price that could be obtained in the market. The price has to be what will give them the highest return given their entire investment scenario. And it turned out to be at the time, this will tell you how long ago, it was $28 a barrel for the spot price of oil. Now, if I had been confident enough in the work that I had done, I would have put all my money into, into spot price of oil and invested you know, in oil futures. Because six months after that, that's where the spot price of oil hit. And so you have the same scenario with the Chinese, and, and I'm not talking necessarily just about the Chinese government, you're talking about the Chinese central bank, Chinese businesses, Japanese businesses, European businesses, American businesses. You've got somebody sitting in the executive office, maybe a whole committee, looking at their overall investments that they hold and where they should be placing them to try to get the highest rate of return given their appetite for risk. And this is going on right now, given this volatile, volatile environment. Yeah. So did quantitative easing uh, help? Yes. Yes, it did. It benefited some players much greater than it benefited other players. Absent quantitative easing, uh, what would have been the options? The well, Republicans been... certainly were not going to improve, approve an increase in corporate tax rates or uh, or marginal tax rates on higher incomes. So you have two choices and we'll get we'll get to the one pretty soon that is now being discussed but which is not being discussed in the public and that's MMT. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Okay. Any any other comments uh, or questions so so far? So let's take a look at employment figures here. Let me pull up that chart. Okay, so here's part-time employees over time. People who were employed, this is the current cycle now. And a lot of people were up until fairly recently <coughs> still employed part-time. And we now have reports telling us that companies are having a very difficult time finding people to fill positions that they have available. And what do companies do when the labor supply doesn't meet their needs? And even, even often just as a normal course of, of trying to uh, maximize output per input. Okay, so, so what's going on now is 
is trying to find people who can fill jobs. And if you can't, you have to move towards technology. So more and more robotics, more and more uh, use of, of uh, you know, automation. The question that that produces then is, what's the long-term impact of moving away from people to automation and robotics and artificial intelligence? How many of you, when you, when you dial up, uh, when you try to call your credit card company or anybody for service actually gets a person who answers the phone? You get, you get some, you get the phone answers by a computer and that computer through artificial intelligence asks you a series of questions. And maybe, maybe 10 minutes later, uh, you're going to be referred to an actual person. But the hope is that your, whatever issue you have is going to be fully resolved before you need to talk to a person. As of June of this year, there were about 25 million people in the U.S. workforce who were looking, who were working part time. Uh, however, the U.S. Department of Labor reported that this total, uh, that of this total, only 3.6 million were employed part time because they were unable to to find full time employment. Um, and this is the lowest level since August of 2001. What do you think is the main reason given? why people who could be employed full-time choose to be employed part-time. Mothers with children. The difficulty of, inf of finding affordable child care keeps most of the uh, many, many women from accepting a full-time job. Um, <clears throat> we, we men might be slowly becoming more enlightened than in past generations. I'm not sure that's true, but, but hopefully it's, it's somewhat true. But there aren't that many fathers who are staying home or working part-time uh, in order to take care of their children. It's the burden still disproportionately falls on mothers or grandmothers. I mean, the ideal situation is if, if you have, you know, if you have parents who live nearby and they're, they're willing to handle taking care of your children so you can go to work full time. So there, there, there's another major social issue that has to be resolved to deal with the shortage of of people to work in companies that need, need workers. Take a look at this chart. This is real median household income uh, against GDP. Is there a correlation? This is what the, the chart is trying to suggest that the Fed puts out. Okay. How, how close of a correlation is there? Well, there's some correlation, but it's certainly not you know, one on one. <clears throat> so household income if you looked at the numbers more closely household income has experienced two major shocks during the current economic cycle first inflation adjusted median household income didn't recover to the 2000 level in two th until 2016 okay median household income what does that mean means half of households are at that figure or above, half of that, half of households are at that figure or below. So it doesn't necessarily tell you whether or not their situation improved uh, financially overall or not. It just is, is one measure. Second, the pandemic has been a major shock to our economy and to our, our institutions almost across the board. So I think what's important to remember is that those in the upper half of households are the owners of assets. And those asset values have generally speaking been climbing since 2010. Not universally so, of course. <clears throat> Property values, for example, 
are increasing in some parts of the United States much faster than in other parts. And there are still pockets in the United States where property values have either been stagnant or are declining. So if you, um, if you, if you want to escape some of the worst uh, experiences of climate change and you're looking for affordable housing and you do not need employment, there are places you can move to in the United States that are really good places to live. Buffalo, New York might be one. Very reasonable property values, um, not a bad climate anymore, good amenities, uh, as long as you don't necessarily need to have a job. So this is, this is one aspect of what's going on with retirees. We have the demographics in the United States where the baby boom generation, um, I think, I can't see everyone's picture, but I assume that many of us on the, in, this, in this course this, this semester uh, are in the baby boom age bracket. And so a lot of us are thinking, hmm, well, we've been living in our neighborhood for, for 40 years. This is where we lived while we worked. Um, we're no longer working. Um, maybe our property taxes are climbing or other, other expenses are climbing. Ought we to think about moving to a different location for some reason? And so that's going to have a major impact on the growth of, the, of different sectors of the United States, affected as well by climate change. So if you were thinking of retiring, let's say right now you live uh, in southern New Jersey, where I live, and you're thinking of retirement, normally, you know, a lot of a lot of people in the Northeast go to Florida. Well, what about climate change and rising sea levels? Well, okay, if if I'm afraid to move to Florida because of the fear of of uh, uh, rising tides or or other problems, I might think of the Southwest. Well, what's the biggest problem in the Southwest related to climate change? Anybody say it? Water. Water, yeah. I mean, uh, Lake Mead is way down. Um, you know, the growing population in places like Las Vegas and Phoenix, Arizona, and other cities, um, they have a, a very serious problem with, you know, with getting enough water for their, for their population. And there's a battle out in the West between urban and rural people. Agriculture uses a lot of the water supply. They have rights that go back to the 1800s. And there's regional battles and discussions over what to do about getting enough water to people. So we have, we have a lot of uh, issues facing us in the next immediate number of years that are going to have significant impacts on the decisions that people make about migration and moving, et cetera. Uh, and who knows how that's all going to work out? Whoops. And of course, uh, nothing new about the rising cost of gasoline. Uh, um, every time you go to fill up your, your automobile now, is it going to be $50? It's going to be $60? I happen to drive a, an automobile that requires premium gasoline. It is, it is no fun to go to the, to the uh, gas station. And, <laughs> and uh, we have, <clears throat> excuse me, we're struggling to adjust to the disruption of the long established economic relations uh, and the global exchange of commodities all of this associated with what's happening in the Ukraine, uh, but look at the profits that that are being made by the oil companies, and what's what what's the government going to do uh, to impose a windfall profits tax on these companies? Uh, we'll see. <clears throat> but but there again, what it what is Exxon? What is Mobil? What are what are they all doing with these excess profits? Are they are they using those excess profits to, to invest in increasing production 
shifting to um, sustainable energy, uh, or are they are they using it to distribute dividends to shareholders and bonuses to their corporate executives? All of that comes into play with the political environment and what 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 decisions are going to be made and how that will affect the economy. And right now it all seems to be very much at play as one would expect after 2008, many investors sought protection against unstable asset prices by selling some of those assets, tangible or financial and simply moving cash reserves into gold. So the resulting increase in the demand for gold saw its price recover pretty quickly and continue to move upward in the face of uncertainty. So people with the deepest pockets and others who, who uh, have all, always looked to gold as a hedge against inflation you know, are putting money in, into gold, gold. Well, does that produce anything? Uh, the amount of gold being extracted out of gold mines is pretty consistent year after year. Um, there's not a whole lot of new discoveries of gold that I've been able to identify. So, so the, the quantity of gold being produced out of the mines, being refined and being put on the market is really a resale market. So, you know, maybe some of you are sitting on a fair amount of gold. Uh, your question is, well, do I continue to hold it? Do I think the price has now peaked? Should I get out of the gold market for a while, cash out, put it somewhere else, and then get back in? But here again, uh, that is a speculative form of investment. Is it really contributing to the real economy? It's, or is it simply a secondary market shifting uh, profits from one uh segment of, of investors to another. <clears throat> now let's take a look at uh, mortgage originations as a, as a measure of what's been going on. The, um, the Federal Reserve almost immediately after 2008 started to think about how to prop up the property markets. And obviously, two things have to be done. One is you have to make credit available. Uh, and you have to, to add to affordability by lowering mortgage interest rates. So they did that. So look at the gold or orange number of figures at the bottom of this, this graph. That is purchase money mortgages. Purchase money mortgages is simply mortgage financing provided to people who, who are purchasing homes is fairly stable. So even during the years of, of a lot of upheaval, <clears throat> the fundamental part of that market held firm. Prices were, were increasing after 2010, but with the reduction in mortgage interest rates, there was plenty of money being available. It's also, you know, important to remember that the uh, U.S. Treasury stepped up and basically said, we're going to invest in all of the mortgage-backed securities that are issued by the banking sector. <laughs> so even though Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac went into conservatorship, um, that did not stop the flow of money available in the secondary market to so that the, the, the mortgage originators, including commercial banks, could originate the loans and offset the risk basically to the federal government. And the other part of this, this chart shows that there's a heavy volume of refinance activity that's occur that occurred during this whole, whole period. Now, the gamble today is, of course, interest rates are going up. So there's less possibility for people to refinance out of their existing mortgage loan to, in order to save funds. That's just not the dollars, the numbers are gonna work there. They, they're, 
the only reasons to refinance are really if you need to pay off other debt. Uh, and that's still going to be much less expensive than, than using a credit card or getting an installment loan or an equity line of credit even. But uh, you might need to pay for your son or daughter's college education or other purposes. So one part of what we're going to experience in the next couple of years is <clears throat> what's going to happen to these two lines. What's going to happen to the purchase money mortgage volume and what's going to happen to the refinance volume? Uh, to, to see how strong the financial sector will be, getting back to, again, the same issue of main, maintaining transaction volume a, in order to generate fee income and, and uh, for banks or mortgage, mortgage servicing companies, the servicing income. And all of that depends upon how many people are coming into the market, taking on new debt in order to provide provide that fee income that's going to be ge potentially generated. If those numbers go way down, then those sectors are going to be in a declining situation as well, maybe laying off people. Um, and by 2026, that could be a serious issue. Then, <clears throat> uh, I go ahead and we see. Uh, let me ask, I, I, I hope that looking at all this data and these charts is useful and education and that I'm not, it's not starting to get blurry eyed and your know, brain is starting to get uh, uh, fried by, by all of it. But, but I think this is, this, is, this is the information that we have to work with to tell us where we have been, where we are, and hopefully... Uh, give us some insight into where we're going. May I ask a question, Edward? Um, you showed a graph that, that, that said uh, new buyers coming in. We call them first-time buyers over here. Yes. Um, there's, also, there's also house owners who, 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 are, who, who are going in the other direction. They are basically dying and having to uh, relinquish their, their, their thing. Are there are there graphs to compare the you know this uh, you know these these two tendencies and because and, and if there's a genuine increase in more home ownership then obviously more houses have to be built but but is is there a basic equilibrium of, of, of people relinquishing the need for their house and 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 those who need to find something on and and to get justice in that in, in that natural scenario well. Uh, I don't have any any data. Maybe someone else has a handle on this part of what's happening, but uh, but there's a couple of things to to suggest to think about. One is uh, when older people sell their property, um, younger households tend to move in. So you have demographic changes in neighborhoods. Younger families bring children. Children require schooling, <clears throat> so it could affect the budgeting process for the school district. In the United States, our schools are mostly funded locally through the property tax and by some what are called state equalizations uh, uh, with income taxes. So some income tax gets collected and then distributed to schools based on a formula of need. Um, but you have right now, you know, you know, with with the aging population in the United States, you're going to have all sorts of changes in household composition, and in some instances, <clears throat> when when an elderly person passes away, their property is inherited by a young a younger member of the family. They might sell that property or they might use it for rental income. So a lot of different things can happen with the ass assets. Mm -hmm. And it's also, there are, at least in the United States, different states have, have a combination of inheritance taxes and estate taxes. And then there's the federal government that imposes the same sort of an inheritance tax or estate tax on, on households. <clears throat> and and a lot depends on whether or not 
you have linear errors. If you don't have linear errors, your tax obligations are going to be higher, uh, generally speaking. And there are all sorts of exemptions uh, built into the system. <clears throat> so, so some university uh, graduate students uh, may be working on a study that that deals with all those dynamics and can can give an answer of what the what the the distributional effects are going to be and how much turnover is going to occur in different neighborhoods by neighborhood in different different cities and regions of the country. I asked the question because it exercised in my my economic studies really because of this this seemingly a seeming injustice can build up if if the inherited wealth is simply passed down to 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 a, to, to a few rather than go back into the common fund as it were. Well, <clears throat> well, the, in the United States, Michael, uh, <laughs> we have a debate over what's fair <laughs> and uh, some people feel that inheritance that earned earned assets value earned asset values during one's life should be passed on to heirs or to anyone or any institution without taxation or limit or minimal taxation i earned it why should <clears throat> why should the government get it <clears throat> Oh boy. <clears throat> but there are others who, who feel this is a um it is somewhat un, unethical. And one argument that's been made even by someone like Warren, Warren Buffett, very wealthy individual, says, Well, I could never have reached this level of wealth without the institutional environment in which I live. And so the laws of the United States. The, the support systems enabled me to do this. And so uh, I have an obligation to return a good portion of it to society. I agree. And, and we have that, we have that debate. Yeah. No, it, 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 you know, it's a very interesting concept and uh, it, it, it's, it's at the root of all, all Henry George's principles that people occupy, you know, it's a, uh, how to get a real justice really uh, and it's a difficult one because we all we're all seeking uh, um an advantage really and and we, we don't really question the, uh, the the moral aspect generally and unless we're very comfortable and afford to give a little of it, little of it but we don't want to give it all <laughs> the, the last last two two parts of this course we'll spend a lot more time talking about justice and uh, potential redistribution or distribution policies and what impact they would have on the objective of uh, the, the uh, nirvana for an economist is sustainable non-inflationary growth or minimal inflationary growth. So yeah, is that a reasonable objective? Should we pr be pursuing that or should we be in a steady state, state society is, is a steady state economy what we should be pursuing. That's, you know, uh, various economists have, have proposed that that should be our objective. And environmentalists are now suggesting that, you know, our level of consumption is not sustainable and we need to somehow figure out how to limit uh, or get to a point of, of What's the right term? Homeostate, homo, homeostasis? Is that the right term? Anyway, we're just about out of time. Uh, I don't want to go too much further tonight. Uh, <clears throat> but just this last slide here, I think, is, is of some, some interest that shows the refinance applications and what's happening you know, uh, now. And you can see the downturn. So as interest rates have climbed, as, as you would predict and expect, the ability of people to refinance uh, for whatever reason has been reduced. And depending upon the level of default or, or delinquencies that begin to occur, the credit providers are going to become more and more restrictive. And so, whereas you might be able to get a 
a market rate loan today at, at let's say six percent uh, on on uh, to refinance or get a cash out refinance, uh, you might only need a credit score of 680 or 700. But six months from now, uh, in order to get that same amount of money at a higher rate of interest, you might need a credit score of 740, depending upon you know, what the bank economists are expecting to see in terms of delinquencies and, and losses according to loan defaults. Um, so I will stop there for, for now, and we can chat as long as you would like to, um, but we'll pick up the, the story from that point on next, next week. Peter. Yes. Um, so my question, I guess, really is kind of looking towards next week and the weeks after uh, during this course. But, you know, I'm, I'm really dying to know what is it in the Georgia's land cycle that says 2026 20, is the year as opposed to later this year or early next year. You know, we've got global, you know, kind of crisis with wars and, and, and all the rest that everybody knows about. So you, what's going to delay the destructive, uh, you know, the, the, the apocalypse uh, a couple of years, two, you know, more, two, three, four years into the future? What, how, why not now? Well, <clears throat> I don't. I don't necessarily have a a crystal ball. the The historical record is that these cycles last, on average, eighteen and a half years. And so, the actions taken by government and governments at all levels are going to determine whether or not the cycle occurs right on time, a little ahead of time, or a little bit you know, after 2026. Um, but 20, that, that's a long way in the future, if you think about it, you know? Yeah, I mean, well, we're well, what we're, we're now, what is now being discussed is a recession. And we've had, I think the total is 12 since the end of the Second World War. And each recession has had a, a different length and a different uh, depth. Some have been more severe than others. And certainly the, the, the contraction that occurred in 2008 was on, on a par with the worst. The, the one, the one uh, analysis that, it, that I'm going to cover next week a little bit is the, the depression in the 1930s and the concentration of wealth in the United States in 2008 was, or 2007, was the same concentration that existed in 1929. Yeah. And so that's a level of stress on the economy that could no longer be sustained. Was it the trigger that caused the contraction? Was it the subprime mortgage uh, debacle? Um, <clears throat> you know, it, sitting at my desk, and looking at performance figures in the mortgage arena and watching market share move away from conventional financing into the subprime area was scary. Because the, these, if you understand that, that part of the business, um, mortgage originators were getting paid higher fees to steer people into the subprime market because the nominal yields were much higher than in the conventional business. Those loans were packaged into what were called private label mortgage-backed securities marketed by Wall Street to investors. The underwriting of the individual loans that went into those securities was non-existent. Often, <clears throat> the loans were fraudulent. Were, were what? How, how, fraudulent. Did they get, how did they get uh, marketed by Wall Street? Well, remember they got they, they got Moody's gave them a triple A yeah. bond rating. Right. Regulatory on capture. Fee, on what basis did they do that? They closed their eyes and took their fees. Yeah. So so there's the buildup of stresses that are that are occurring in every economic cycle. There are these other 
uh, systemic problems, and then there are shocks to the system. So um, all things being equal, I'm expecting 2026 to be that point where maximum stress occurs. Maybe the government will do some, take some steps to postpone it. Or maybe the government, not just the United States government, but, but governments generally will take steps to protect what they perceive to be their own self-interest and the aggregate effect will be to bring down the global economy. Um, I, I wish I could say I have I have a positive feeling about what's going to happen. I'm hopeful but not optimistic. But but the only way that that decisions are going to be made that make sense is if this kind of the discussion and and it's uh, I don't have any standing you know in uh, in the in the arena where these decisions are being made. Most economists don't have a, have a standing in that arena. Uh, you, can, you can go on the internet, uh, on any major university and go into their economics department. There are dozens, hundreds of papers being written uh, based on you know, models of the economy that are being run with, with changing the variables to, to test scenarios. And the banking sector is doing that now. The Federal Reserve requires the banks to do the stress tests, to meet these stress tests. Well, are those stress tests valid? We're going to find out. Uh, we, we, we don't really know because of, every, because of what has been happening under quantitative easing to simply keep pumping enough money into the economy <clears throat> to make sure that there's enough money that can be circulated to meet demand. Joe, how are you? I'm good, thank you. And I'm hoping uh, you feel better soon. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I apologize. Uh, I, I wish my... Well, hopefully it's not COVID, right? Um, no, I... it, while we're speculating about what could happen, um, another, part, another scenario that's quite different is that we are entering uh, a prolonged wartime economy and the war is on climate change, and there could be enormous uh, investments going on, essential investments uh, and responses to climate change, which will actually do the reverse. It will cause a, like, a, like in wartime, an enormous boom, an enormous shortage of labor, et cetera. So that's just another possible scenario we might consider. I, and, and I will be presenting some, some data to suggest that that's that is a uh, a positive, you know, part of what's what's in, happening right now, and the and the question is, uh, will funds be available, and will they be channeled into the investment, in, into the investments that will will bring us to a point where we will be minimally dependent upon fossil fuels. And therefore, reduce our carbon footprint. And um, there was a really interesting episode last week on 60 Minutes that um, the um, officials in Bermuda, or no, not, not Bermuda, the Bahamas were interviewed. They had a catastrophic hurricane in 2020. Um, and you know, the island was the islands were destroyed. Um, those islands are totally dependent, have been up to now on electric plants that provide their electricity that all run on diesel fuel. So with this hurricane, they decided that that was no longer workable because importing the, the diesel fuel, given weather conditions and all of that was impossible. So they immediately began a program of building um, uh, basically uh, mini solar plants, solar electric plants on the islands. And they now, they're, they're, we're working toward getting to 
of using these these you know micro solar plants to provide their electricity and one of the advantages they said they talked about was that the construction of these solar solar plants uh, means that they will never go out of service the hurricane can't destroy them and so immediately after the hurricane the electricity is still on well, will the United States and will other countries take a look at that and make the same level of commitment as the Bahamas? I don't, I don't know, but 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 it's certainly a, a promising uh, shift in investment. On the other hand, what are the raw materials required to build these solar panels and uh, is, are they readily available? It's, it's just like this, the sources of um, lithium for lithium batteries. We'll move to electric automobiles in a major way. Um, is there enough natural resource to, to construct, to build all these lithium batteries? And then what do we do about, about disposal of those batteries? So, I mean, the law of unforeseen consequences seems to be everywhere. And how good are we as human beings thinking ahead and saying, okay, if we do X or Y or Z, what is going to then be the outcome, the long-term outcome? It might solve an immediate problem for us, but is it going to create even greater problems down the road than it is solving in the short run? I don't know. <laughs> so... Thank you. Be hopeful, and and there are there are very many many smart people working on the technology sides of the problems. I'm not sure that the people working on the economic policy side of the problems are as smart. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else have any any questions or comments before we uh, break off tonight? Okay, well, uh, I will be quiet and let Ibrahima uh, uh, give you any message he would like to give you at the for for coming programs, etc. And I hope to see all of you next Wednesday evening. Uh, yes, Ed, if you wouldn't mind uh, just giving a, a short intro to what next the next session is going to be about. Well, we're just going to pick up the story, and we'll be spending a lot more time next week on uh, on some of the history of economic cycles. In particular, we'll spend a fair amount of time talking about uh, the Great Depression of the 1930s and, the, and what in the 1920s helped to lead up to that. Wonderful, thank you very much. And everybody, thank you for joining us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Uh, not tomorrow, next week at the same time. <laughs> I'm so excited about your class, Ed. All right. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you.